Well, if you would open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1, we're going to begin looking at God's Word in Genesis 1, in verse 6. We're going to take Genesis 1, 6 through chapter 2, verse 3, so we're going to cover that this morning in the message. And if you're using the outline that's found in the bulletin, you'll see that at the top of the outline I included something that several people requested from last week's message, and that was a breakdown of how Key, a key word throughout the book of Genesis is used, and it has to do with the word generations, or some translations say, this is the account of. And you'll see it's a small print at the top of your outline there. There's 11 different uh, stories within the one big story in Genesis, the entire book of Genesis, and they're sequels. For the most part, they're sequels. In other words, this event gave birth to this event which then gave birth to this event. This is the account of this generation, and this is the account of this generation, which sprang out of this generation. That's how it's laid out. This is the way the book is, is written. This is what the author intended, and we saw last week, that this is God's word for us, not written to us, written to a Hebrew or Israelite audience, Moses' day, Moses being the author that God spoke to, in the first five books of the Bible. Last week, we looked at Genesis 1-1 as an introduction, where he says in Genesis 1-1, basically, I'm about to tell you a story. And in Genesis 2, verse 1, he says, I just told you a story about the heavens and the earth and the heavens and the earth. So God's about to do something here in seven days. And Genesis 1-1 is taking place outside of those seven days, it appears. And in Genesis 1-2, there's material already present, but there's no order, there's no purpose, there's chaos, there's darkness. In Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we looked at last week, is where God created a period of light and he called it day. He called it day. In other words, God created time. He created time on day one. And I want you to pay attention to a few words that you're going to see pop up throughout this section this morning that we're going to look at when we look at the rest of the days of creation. I want you to pay attention to the word separated or separating. I'd like you to pay attention to whenever God calls something, he names it, when God names. Because one of the ways God creates is by separating and naming things. So pay attention to that as we go through this passage. When God separates and names things, he's distinguishing one thing from another. And in that sense, he's creating it. To name something is to create it. I think we can understand that because in your home, you name a room and you give it a distinct purpose. Now, the previous homeowner might have called it the extra bedroom or the spare bedroom, but you buy the house and you rename it and you repurpose it as your office. You've created it in that sense. You remake it. You give it a purpose. You set it aside. So pay attention to separating, naming, and pay attention to this too, the repetition of the word good or or very good. When God creates, it's good. And by good... It's not talking about moral good versus evil. It's talking about purpose. It has a purpose. Okay, with that in mind, here's, uh, uh, this outline's a little bit different. As you look at the screen, what we're looking at is what God did. He formed it. He's forming things. On the first three days, he's forming things. And so if you want to write this down, uh, well, first of all, here's, here's a sentence. Write this sentence down. What kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell? I'm going to keep circling back to that question. What kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell? Oftentimes, we try to make it tell our story that we're interested in, but the biblical author, inspired by the Holy Spirit, being Moses, is writing this story for a very specific purpose. And so we have to keep coming back to this question as we understand the meaning, the meaning of Genesis 1 is what kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell us? So we'll keep coming back to that question during the message. But the next thing I'd like you to do in your outline, if you'd write this down, is that God forms it. On day one, he made time. We saw that last week. Time. 
Now, if you hear about God creating time and you are a recently released slave, that you and your people have been slaves for over 400 years in Egypt, and as far as you're concerned, time, not in terms of minutes and seconds like we might think of time, but time is cruel. Time has punished you. Time seems chaotic. Time seems like something that Pharaoh controlled. He was in charge of what happened in the time that you were in existence here on earth. And so time was seen as very, very purposeless in the minds of Hebrews and the, the Israelites. And I'll, use, I'll call the Israelites Hebrews from this point forward because that's how Moses refers to his people, is the, is the Hebrews. But God spoke time into existence. Time... Moses wants to teach these recently released slaves that time serves God's purposes. That God is in control of time and he created time. It's not a physical thing, but it's a real thing called time. Now look with me, if you would, at chapter 1, verse 6. Look what it says. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky. See, he's naming something. He's calling it. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. I didn't know this, but this week I discovered in, in my study and getting ready for this, I didn't realize that in the ancient world, everyone in the ancient world believed that the sky was solid. I didn't know that. It was a solid sky. So the solid blue sky is what they believed held back the rain, like a vault above them. And they believed there was water up there, and it was separated from the water they knew here on earth. So there's a vault, and there's a space in between that they lived in. And so I circle back to that question, what kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell us? This vault between the solid sky as they saw it and the solid ground here on earth, and the space in between, that's where they lived. That's where they lived. In other words, God created an environment where the waters above are regulated, and the waters below serve a purpose. And I guess one way we would maybe understand that would be the weather. God created the weather, the environment we live in. Would you write that down? God not only forms time, but in your outline, let's just keep building this. In day two, it's about the weather. Let's move to day three. Day three is found in verses 9 through 13. And again, you'll see, if you look at the text, that God speaks and he names. He names things that already exist. And those things that exist, he now shapes them and gives them purpose, and he forms them. So the seas, as you'll see, look at the verse there, the seas are gathered, the dry land appears, and plants sprout. Look at the end of verse 12. It says, and God saw that it was, here's the word, good. Good means it serves a purpose. This now serves a purpose. God has formed time, and he's formed weather, so what's the purpose? What's the purpose of this? Look at what it says in verse 13. There was evening and there was morning the third day. So what's the third day about? Would you write this down? Food. The third day is about food. And by the way, any culture would recognize the importance of time and weather and food. In Genesis chapter 8, after the flood of Noah the Lord highlights three things that Noah can count on. God says, I want you to know, Noah, you can count on three things. Here's the scripture passage in Genesis chapter 8. It says this, As long as the earth endures, God said, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night will never cease. Noah, you've just gone through a cataclysmic experience here on earth, and I want you to know there's three things that aren't going to change, and there they are. You've written them down. He's summarizing what he says in Genesis chapter 1. Food, weather, and time. It's not going to change. It's going to be there. So on days 1 through 3, God puts order and he forms he, things that already exist. But now we look at days 4 through 6. In, in, in days 4 through 6, would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down the word fills? God fills it. 
God begins in the first three days. He forms what exists. And then in the last three days, he now fills it. He fills it. So let's look at day four. Beginning in verse 14, and again, God speaks and he separates things that exist in the sky above. And to the Hebrews and the Egyptians, the sun and the moon and the stars, as you can look at the passage, you see it there, they, they believed that those were etched on the bottom of the solid blue sky, just etched there. They didn't see them as material objects so much, but they knew what they did. They gave off light, and they were very important. You had to have them. Most of the ancient world actually thought that the sun, moon, and stars were different gods to be worshipped. And Moses wants them to know, do not worship creation. Do not worship the sun, moon, and stars. Because God created them. They're not gods. They're creations. God created them to fill a purpose and fulfill something that God formed already in the sky, the vault above. Look with me at verse 16. Chapter 1, verse 16 says, God made two great lights. The greater light to... Now, notice this. Notice the word govern. Govern. You might want to circle that word, govern. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault in the sky to give light on the earth. Verse 18, to, and there's the word again, govern, to govern the day and the night and to separate light from darkness. God saw that it was Here's the word again, good. It served a purpose. Verse 19, and there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. Moses is telling them here, do not worship the sun, moon, and stars. They were put in place to serve God's purposes. And they're like like foremen on a construction site. They govern God puts them there with a purpose to govern. The sun governs something. The moon governs something. The stars govern something. They guide the work that takes place here on earth. They are servants. They govern. God put them here to regulate what happens on earth, not to be worshipped. And so if you want to write this down in day four, one way to describe day four is these, these, the sun, moon, and stars are servants of the seasons. Would you write that down in your outline? They're servants of the seasons. Now notice something after you've written that down. There's a parallel between day one and day and day and day four. Do you see the parallel? Time on day one, and then the servants who use time, they govern it, they oversee it, they match each other. There's a matching going on there. They're not exactly the same, but they're kind of alike one another. And in fact, they need each other. God keeps doing this in Genesis 1. He creates things that are kind of like each other and need each other. So what kind of story is Genesis trying to tell us? And again, go back to this uh, house, home illustration. God is filling his creation with furniture. The way that you fill a room with furniture, and when you put a piece of furniture in a room, you're saying something about how that room is supposed to function. But what's the purpose? We're seeing this is what God's doing. He's forming. He's filling. But what's the purpose of it? Now we move to day five. Look with me at verse 20. Verses 20 to 23, God speaks and he creates another match. Something else is going to match. They're going to parallel one another. Two things that need each other. He formed the weather on day two and now he fills the atmosphere, the weather, the environment, the sky and the water with creatures. That's what he does here on day five. He fills it with creatures that fly and that swim. And I want you to see the parallel there. Would you write this down? Day five, these are servants of weather. The environment. These are servants that can do something that the sun and the moon can't do. The sun and the moon don't reproduce. But look what these living creatures can do. They can reproduce. These these creatures that swim and fly that God put into his creation and fills his creation with, they can reproduce. Look with me at verse 21. 
This is unique. He has, this hasn't happened before. Verse 21, so God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves in it, notice this, according to their kinds. And every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that, here's the word again, it was good. It served a purpose. Now, the ancient world had great fear of the seas and the ocean. The sea and the ocean was seen as a horribly evil, dark, chaotic place that nobody could control. And what, what Moses is saying as God is inspiring him with the story he's telling about creation is that, is that on this day, on day five, God created what you think is uncontrollable. God is in charge of it. The greatest sea creature you can imagine Every living creature serves a purpose and God controls it. So I go back to the question at the top of your outline. What kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell us? Look with me at day 6. You're going to see that day 6 receives a lot of ink compared to the other days. The story slows down in day 6. It gets longer. He takes more time to talk about it. Beginning in verse 24, again, God speaks, and living creatures that can reproduce emerge from the land. Look what it says. They emerge from the land, and God says it's good. These living creatures, they serve a purpose. They fill what he's formed. But now he's going to do something extra, extra special here on day six. Look with me at verse 26. This is really special. Verse 26 says, Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky and over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. We'll stop there. God put us into his world. So we have a purpose for our existence. God created us in his image to rule his creation as his stewards, his stewards. Would you write that down? Stewards of creation. Guess what the stewards of creation need? They need food to keep, to keep living. They need food. They need food. The food wasn't created so that, so that we would gather up food and feed the gods. You see, that's what the ancient world thought. We need to grow food so we can offer sacrifices to God and feed the gods. And Moses is saying, God doesn't need your food. He created food for you, for you to live in his world and take care of it. So this world is God's world, and we are stewards of this world, and our job is to care for it because we don't own it. God is the creator of it. So what kind of story is this telling? We keep going back to that question. As former slaves, they certainly are asking the question, why are we even here? Why did God even make us? Is this all our existence is about, is to be slaves for 400 and maybe 50 years? What good, what good, 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 good do we serve in this world? And Moses says, you're created in the image of God. And he made you and he formed you and he filled the heavens and earth so it was good, it has a purpose. And you have the honor, Moses is saying, you have the honor to be there as God's special assistance, if you want to call it that you're assisting, you're a steward, you're bringing order, you're bringing order to what God has created. In other words, the Hebrews were not trying to figure out the age of the earth. There's something to take note of today. They're not trying to figure out how old it is. They're not, they're not asking questions about 
quarks and light as, you know, particles or waves or... They're not asking those... We ask those questions. They're not asking those questions. They want to know what is our purpose. A man named John Walton, who's a professor of Old Testament at a very reputable Christian school, uh, Wheaton College, known for its academic excellence and also its theological uh, uh, emphasis and, and biblical uh, teaching. Wheaton College, John Walton, he, he used a helpful analogy I came across this week, and he talks about when we move into a new place, uh, we investigate all sorts of things. We, we've all been there. You know, you want to know about the physical structure of the house, the physical structure. I want to know what's the roof like, what's the furnace like, does it need a new air conditioning, uh, what's the electrical system like? What's the plumbing like? Does it all work? Has it passed inspection? We ask those questions about the house. But we also ask a different set of questions. We ask about it being a home. Is this a home? In other words, when we walk through this new place that we might buy, we want to know which rooms will be used in what way. We, may, we do that really quickly, but it's important to us. Is it going to serve us? Where will the furniture be and who gets which bedroom? I know this was really important to Marcy and I when we looked for our home in Maple Grove. We knew what we wanted to find and we had something in mind, but there was a functional purpose that was really important to us because I office out of the home. Um, when I'm on the phone talking with you, I talk loud like I do now. And when I talk loud, it drives people in the house crazy. So we ran a little test of this home before. Every home we went to, I went down to whatever I would call my office, because I'd office out of the home. I'd go down into that room. Marcy would stand at the other end of the house where she could live and be happy without me bothering her. And I would be down there, and I'd start talking like I was on the phone to see if, to see if this house fit our purpose. But, one, you know, here's something. We settled into the house. We, we know about the house. We had to do some structural things to the house. We, had, we all have to do some fixer-uppers to the house usually. But the big question is, can this house be our home? Home. You know, and once you've settled into your house, maybe you've, you've done this. Most of us have. You have a guest over to your, your home where you've settled. And if you've ever had a guest over, you know, they might ask about the place you live in. Tell us about your home. And usually they're not looking for a detailed scientific explanation of how the plumbing works or the electrical system or the HVAC. Now, the explanations exist, but that's not what they're asking. They're asking about how you've turned this house into a home, a home. They're asking when it became your home, how it became your home. So I ask you this. I go back to the question at the top of your outline. What kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell us? The ancient world was more interested in how this world became our home. Not scientific lectures on the house. Genesis 1 is a home story, not a house story. See the difference? Now, by the way, it is a house. There's an electrical system, there's a plumbing system, but that's not what's driving the curiosity of the Israelis, the Hebrews. So it's a house, but more importantly, it's your home. And it's interesting, Jesus uses this language when he talks to his disciples before he leaves, before his death, burial, and resurrection. He says to them, it's on the screen in John 14, Jesus says this, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. It's a real place. It's a house. If that were not so, I would have told you. Would I have told you I'm going to prepare a place for you? Verse 3 on the screen. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. It's a place. But more importantly, it's your home. You're with Jesus. You're in relationship. He has formed it, and now he's going to fill it with you for all of eternity, and you're going to enjoy it, and it's going to be so good. Look at verse 
Look at uh, verse, chapter 2, verse 1. Because day seven is the point of the story. Day seven is the point. Look, chapter 2, verse 1. This is day seven. It says in verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, now I'm going to stop here, and I want you, if you would, in your Bibles, to circle a few important words. The words you're about to circle are words that when the, when the Hebrews heard these words, something very specific came to their minds. And it's the point of the story. The first word I'd like you to circle is rested. Would you circle that word? He rested. God rested from all his work. End of verse 2. Look at verse 3. It continues. It says, then God blessed. Would you circle the word blessed? God blessed the seventh day and made it, now circle this word, holy. Holy. Circle the word holy. Now continue reading. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So you've circled the word rest, you've circled the word blessed, and you've circled the word holy. And in the, in the Hebrew mind and in the Egyptian mind, in the mind of the entire ancient world, when they would hear those three words in their languages, they thought of one thing. That is temple worship language. That is temple worship language. God rests in a temple. God is present in a place. And the point of Genesis 1 is God did all this forming and all this filling to create a sacred Space. So let's go back to the question at the top of your outline. What kind of story is Genesis 1 trying to tell us? It's a temple inauguration story. So would you write this down in your outline? Uh, day 7, you'll see, is underneath. It's set aside from all the other days. It's a temple of worship. When all the dust settles from all the work of creating and making days one through six, when there's stability, think of this, there's stability, there's order, chaos is gone, there's no more chaos. Now all of a sudden, everything God creates, everything he formed, everything he filled, everything serves a purpose, and it's in to enjoy. Listen, it's to enjoy our new home. And it's built as a temple to be in relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, the Garden of Eden, which we'll see next week, is a sanctuary where man and woman meet with God and take care of his creation. You know what that means? They worship. They met with him in the cool of the day. They worshiped. They were in relationship with him, and it was very good. Everything served its purpose. If you want to look at your Bible this way, look at the first few chapters of your Bible as the grand opening. The grand opening that says, this is a temple inauguration where heaven and earth are a place where you are at home and you are worshiping. Now look at the last few chapters of your Bible. It is a temple inauguration where the new heavens and the new earth, and there's a temple, and all of God's, all of God's people over all the ages get together and they worship God. You were created for that place that Jesus Christ created. He made you for this. Worship is the point of the Bible. And so I want you to see this, the good news application. Well, before I get to the application, I, I want to say one thing about science. I'm not a scientist. The seven days of Genesis chapter 1 is not written for us to figure out the age of the earth. In fact, there's no, I don't believe, any biblical position on the age of the earth. Now, by the way, if it turns out to be young, then great. It's young. Super. But don't feel like in order to follow Jesus, you have to have a young earth position because the Bible says so. It doesn't say that explicitly. What's the purpose of the story? Now, if there's no information in the biblical text on the age of the cosmos, let's call it, then as followers of Jesus today, 
who take our Bible very seriously as God's inerrant authoritative word, we have nothing to defend. Science isn't your enemy. No, it might have good things to offer, so be open to it. Consider it. The good news is this, that we don't have to choose between young earth or old earth based on Genesis 1 because Genesis 1 wasn't telling that kind of story. And to me, that's good news. Would you write this down as an application? The story of Genesis 1 does not force you to choose young earth or old earth. That's not the point of the story. Moses wrote this book. Do you remember when Moses would go before Pharaoh and Moses would say, let my people go? And Pharaoh said, no way, Jose. But Moses kept saying this, let my people go so that they can go into the desert and do what? Worship me. Worship. Worship God who created them. Hear the story of Genesis chapter 1. They hadn't heard it. They had been in Egypt so long, they thought like Egyptians. God had to rewire their brain, give them new truth, reveal this to them so they knew who their creator was, that they were created by God to be in this home where they can worship this home on earth and not as slaves. And to me, that's great news. Would you write this down? Worship is the most important thing we do together. And that is still true today. It was true when Moses talked to Pharaoh, and it's true today for us as followers of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. At the conclusion of the service, prayer partners will be up at the front of the sanctuary, and if you would like to come and have prayer with them, they would love to pray with you about whatever it is that you're burdened about this morning. Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you are the creator of all things. That you formed this world as creator. That you sustain it. That you fill it. That you have made a place for us to worship you because this is the most important thing we can do. This is my Father's world. And God, as we go through this week as followers of Jesus, that we'd remember these very truths and why you preserve this story for our faith, this true story. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.